Welcome to worship. I'm glad you're here to connect with God. I'm Pastor Hans, and this is Martin Luther Lutheran Church. We are the church together. We are spread out, but I'm glad you're here to connect with God. During the season of Lent, we're going to take a little bit look inside ourselves and a little bit of a darker turn to see what are the things that we see that we regret, that we wish we didn't do, that we need to confess and turn over to God. Whatever that is, I invite you to turn your heart to God now. Let us worship. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us confess our sins in the presence of God and one another. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Kiri and Lazo 
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. Merciful God, the fountain of living water, you quench our thirst and wash away our sin. Give us this water always. Bring us to drink from the well that flows with the beauty of your truth through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. What's in pastor's bag? Yeah, what's in pastor's bag? What's in pastor's bag? Yeah, what's in pastor's bag? I don't know what's in there. What's in pastor's bag? Bum, bum. I'm Pastor Hans. I'm Co Pastor Ari. And I'm Pastor Wes. Here we are. Okay, Ari put something no, in here. I'm going to open them. Open yeah, it. I, I... There's something little. It sounds like Legos. Or maybe adorable. Oh, they're not. What are these things, Aria? Yeah. Shopkins. They're like little things, but they look like shop items. Like you get lemonade store, and inside is a little face, a little cutesy face of a thing. And it goes. It's the apple juice. Yeah, so it's called Juicy Juice. Juicy Juice is a brand. Mm -hmm. And Icy from like thing 7 Eleven, or the Slurpee back in the day. And inside is another little Slurpee with a little cutie face on it. Yeah, the thing about. Icy is on the cover. The polar bear's holding Icy. So it's like permanently going in a loop. Whoa. Because look, see? It's on the container. Yeah. It's in his hand. And so you see the one on in his hand also has a picture of the polar bear with one in his hand. And it goes on forever and ever. Oh. So Ari, why do you like these things? Because they're mini and, and they look like shopping items. They're cute little and they're little and they look like items you would get normally at the store. Do you like them because they're collectibles? Yeah. And they're random. And you think about like, so basically, whoever made this is brilliant. Because these brands probably pay money to make Shopkins out of them. So that people like me will pay money to buy them for my little kid because she likes them. And they're just advertisements. Plus 70 IQ. Brilliant. So they're cute little things, right? Yeah. So here's the thing. So do you guys want to know something? Do you know the word Christian means little Christ? And it was first meant as an insult. When the early church and the people who were the early church in Antioch, they said, oh, you want to be like Christ? We'll crucify you and kill you too. Oh. And then they start using the insult of little Christ's. Little Christ is Christian. So we as Christians are to be like Christ. It's okay, Arnie. Come back up. Don't hide it. It's okay. It's probably because we're not on the scale of like Jesus. Exactly. We're not like Jesus. But today is Sunday. Sunday. So the day of our Lord. So we are like Shopkins. The Shopkins are cute little versions of this. We are little versions of Christ. We said, you know what? We're going to take your insult and we're worth pride. We are Christians. We are little Christs. Yeah, so, right back at you. Let's pray. Dear God. Dear God. You are amazing. You are amazing. You make all things good. You make all things good. We strive. We strive. And want to be. And want to be. Like little Christs. Like little Christs. Showing Jesus love. Showing Jesus love. Mercy. Mercy. And compassion. And compassion. To all we meet. To all we meet. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Bye. 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 The first reading, Exodus 17, 1 to 11. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do for this people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people. And take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I'll be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Then 
Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, Choose some men for us and go out. Fight with Amalek tomorrow. I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek, while Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed, and whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. The Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Psalm 6, 1-9 O Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger, or discipline me in your wrath. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am languishing. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are shaking with terror. My soul is also struck with terror. How long, O Lord, how long? Turn, O Lord, save my life. Deliver me for the sake of your steadfast love. For in death there is no remembrance of you. In Sheol, who can give you praise? I am weary with my moaning. Every night I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with my weeping. My eyes waste away because of grief. They grow weak because of all my foes. Depart from me, all you workers of evil, for the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. The Lord has heard my supplication. The Lord accepts my prayer. The second reading, 2 Corinthians 7, 6-10 But God, who consoles the downcast, consoled us by the arrival of Titus, and not only by his coming, but also by the consolation with which he was consoled about you as he told us of your longing, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced still more. For even if I made you sorry with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it, for I see that I grieved you with the letter, though only briefly. Now I rejoice, not only because you were grieved, but because your grief led to repentance. For you felt a godly grief, so that you were not harmed in any way by us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation and brings no regret, but worldly grief produces death. The Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. John, the fourth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get this living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give you will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. 
what you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain. But you say that the place where your people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to Him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When He comes, He will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am He, the one who is speaking to you. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. had a time machine and you could go back and past any time where would you go or should I say when would you go maybe the middle ages maybe to see the crucifixion with Jesus or the empty tomb on that first Easter Sunday but what if I said the question of if you could go in a time machine go back but only to your own life where in your life would you go you could make a change you could do something different where would you go with that time machine and change what you have done or happened to? That question was actually part of the episode, the final episode of Better Call Saul. I'm a huge fan of Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul. And that last episode had this question come up a couple times. If you could have a time machine and go back to your own life and change one thing, what would it be? Now, when Saul asked this, he asked this of Mike. He asked this of a couple other people. He asked of Walter White, and Walter White is indignant about the question. I'm not going to give too much away about the episode, but it's a fantastic ending to the series. And he's indignant because he says, Saul, that doesn't make sense. He said, are you getting at regret? And Saul's like, yeah, what would you change? What do you regret you did? And so they have this conversation about regret. What do they regret that brought them to this point? What do we regret? I must say the first time I ever hear this word, whenever I hear this word regret, I first go to the Snickers commercial where the tattoo artist is eating and they say, you're not yourself when you're hungry. And she's tattooing a big biker guy and on the arm it says, no regrets. <laughs> and it's kind of funny because in a way people live their life by the mantra, no regrets. But if your tattoo artist lived that way and tattooed your arm permanently to say no regrets, would you still feel that way? No regrets. I do say that on occasion. No regrets. It gets to us about because we all have regrets. There's a moment in our life where we may sing and think, oh, I should not have done that. I should not have said that. I should have done this. I should have done that. There's an article I was looking up this week about it, about regrets. And they said the major categories of regrets for people involve our education, our work, our romantic relationships, our parenting, our leisure time. And I thought, great, the five things that basically make up everyday life for us. I didn't think those were particularly helpful. I thought it was actually kind of funny. We regret the big things in life 
and the small themes in life too. We might think about that time late at night, you were lying in bed and you think, oh, that time I said that thing, that person it was so dumb. I regret that. Or that awkward social encounter. You think about that years later. Now, here's the thing. Most people, the other people in that situation don't remember it, but we do. We carry that with us, that shame, that guilt, that embarrassment, that awkwardness. We carry that with us. And so regrets have this kind of awkward power over us. As I was thinking about regrets, I think that I could place them in two major categories. First is the things that we regret we did or said. As I just said, these would be those moments we think about years later that we should have said this or should have said that or should not have said this and should not have said that. We hear in the Old Testament reading today about Moses and the Hebrews. They just left Egypt and they're going out into the Sinai, into the wilderness, and they complain. They've not been out of Egypt like a day. (laughs) And they're already grumbling and complaining. And they say, oh, We're dying of thirst. It would have been better if we died in Egypt as slaves and come out here. And Moses, I can only picture his face. This, really, you really already regret this from slavery to freedom in the first day. And because you're thirsty, you already regret leaving. This is what happened time after time after time after time again in the Old Testament. When the people are in the exodus, when they're in the wilderness, they're in that moment with Moses out there. And they're like, oh, we had it better in Egypt. We should have stayed. And it's almost comical. They regret this thing that they did almost instantly. But it was for the good. A little sacrifice. And they say they regret it. Of course, God goes or God says to Moses, just tap your staff here on the rock. And there's water. And there's water. The people are happy And then they'll complain about food, and then they'll grumble about this and that, no meat, and then it continues on and on. How quick we are to regret. How quick we are to complain about things that that we do, things we've said and done. It's almost as if we live one awkward moment after each other. (laughs) But this regret about what we do, what we say, maybe what we don't do is about us as people, our agency, our ability, our power, what we have within ourselves to do. And then we second guess ourselves. And regret becomes when second guessing becomes shame or guilt. The second big category of regret is we regret when things happen to us. This could easily be about other people's choices that impact us or just situations that happen the generation we're born into, the events that happen around us, the things we have no control over, but yet we think, what would life have been different? I regret that this happened. I regret that I'm part of this time, or I regret what they did to me. This regret can be kind of dark because it's no nothing that we said or did. It's nothing in our power, but things that have happened to us. In the Gospel reading today, it's a long reading. John's readings during Lent are rather long, so we actually cut it in half for the service. Um, And it's the story of the woman at the well. And so Jesus goes with his disciples. They go to Samaria, which is like the cousin of Israel. And they're there. They're the cousins of the Jewish people, but they don't like each other. They really conflict, and they really hate each other. And so he's there at noontime at the well, and he sees one woman. He's by himself, and she's by herself. And he says, can you give me something to drink? And she's like, well, you don't have a bucket. You don't have the things. He said, well, I have the living water. She's like, what do you mean? And they start talking. And he says something about your husband. She goes, I don't live with my husband. And he says, you're right. You've had five husbands. And the man you currently live with, you're not married to. And she's marveled. She's amazed that how can this prophet, this Jewish prophet, know me so well and know what I'm about? And so she'll actually run off to her town and tell all the people, and they actually come on to see for themselves. Commentators have often commented of why this woman is by herself at noontime, which is the hottest part of the day. Because when you go to the well at the hottest part of the day with the heavy load, it's because you're not part of the social clique. You're not part of the fabric of society. You've been outcast. And this woman, obviously, has probably been outcast because she's had these husbands. Now, the text doesn't say directly, but it's easily inferred that she's been because of divorce. Now, there's a possibility that she's been a widow five times. That's possible. 
but most likely it was divorce. And the Samaritans and the Hebrews had the same law, the same Torah. And what that Jewish law and the Samaritan law said is any man could divorce his wife at any moment. All he had to do is get a scribe or get a piece of paper and write, I divorce you, a little writ of divorce and hand it to her, gone, she's out. What's interesting is women could not divorce their husbands. No woman, no matter how bad it was, no matter how horrible he was, how physically abusive or vile he was, no woman could divorce in Jewish tradition. And so even still today, the legal tradition for this in Israel is still one where it really favors the men. Where in American law today, it's anyone can divorce anyone for any reason, any time, just because. And so it's a very different idea. I was talking about this with a friend of mine who's clergy, and he said, well, what did she do to get divorced? And I thought, oh, no, no, you're blaming the victim. She could have been divorced these five times for no fault of her own, for telling the truth, for speaking her mind, not making his favorite lamb stew. It doesn't matter. So I'm sure this woman at the well has lived with this regret that she's ostracized from the community. She's not part of the normal society of the town anymore. And that she's had these five husbands and she's lived with a sixth man. And so this, I'm sure, has this regret. And Jesus talks to her. He sees her. He acknowledges her. He welcomes her in. And he offers her the living water that will never make her thirsty again. So I think that she really, in this moment, sees and feels accepted, understood, and welcomed, even though she probably has a ton of regret about what happened to her in her life. So what do we do with this? How do we live with these feelings of regret? Now, the first thing I'm going to say is during our series of Lent, this is about before I die, I wish. And part of this could be, I wish I hadn't, or I wish I had done, or the wishes with regret that we have. Now, I will say with some regret, there are things we can do about it. Whatever the thing of the caused regret is in the past, they're always in the past. But some things in the past we can atone for, we can make right, we can confess, we can seek forgiveness. And I love that. We are called by God to forgive and to seek forgiveness. There's some things in the past that are in the past, but we may be dealing with it and we may never be able to make it right. There are some things about the regrets we have of events that things happen, things happen to us, things that we do that we regret, that we really have no say over. And so what do we do about those? How do we live? I came across a great quote from a Swiss philosopher, a moral philosopher, which we call ethics today. His name is Henri Amiel, and he says, accept life and you must accept regret. He's acknowledging that we will always have this feeling of regret to some degree. Some might be big, some might be small, some might just be itty bitty, but we will all have this feeling of regret. And so we need to acknowledge this. Henri Amiel is interesting because he was not a famous philosopher. In his lifetime, he was friends with all the great European philosophers of the time, but yet he was basically unknown. Not wealthy, not famous, he wasn't influential. And his most famous work, his most famous book came after he died. His buddies published his private journal and that became his bestseller of all time. His most influential book and he never got to experience it. He experienced a lot of regrets in this life. And so when he says, accept life, you must also accept regret. That carries a lot of weight because he felt that. And so as Christians, we need to acknowledge that there will be things and times and places that are regrettable, that we sin and we mess up. We turn to God for those. We need to go and seek confession and apologize, and we need to seek God to forgive us. But there's also some that we can't do anything about. And so we need to learn to let it go and give to God and say, God, I can't change this, but it's for you. Because the burdens we carry, God says to come and drop off with God. I like that Jesus says, my yoke, my burden is light. Let me take yours. 
Take my burden and I will take yours and I will take all you carry with you, your regrets, your sadness, your shame, your fear, everything we can give to God. Turn over to Christ so that we don't carry it. I pray that you will not carry the regrets that you may have carried your whole life. Give it to God. Give it over and let Christ take that burden. Amen.
prayers of the people. Sustained by God's abundant mercy, let us pray for the church, the world, and all of creation. We pray for your church. Bless partnerships with other Christians in interreligious dialogue. Guide the daily work of denominational and congregational leaders. Strengthen our combined witness for the sake of the gospel, that all experience your life-giving love. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We pray for the universe, all creation teems with life, from the depths of the earth and seas to the skies above. Fill us with awe and reverence for the diversity and preservation of life. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We pray for the nations of the world, topple the dividing walls that separate us from our neighbors. Form us into your beloved community where diversity of gender, race, language, ability, and ethnic origin is celebrated and affirmed. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We pray for those who suffer in mind, body, or spirit. Be present with all who are lonely and give courage to all who are afraid. Comfort those who live with chronic illness or other sickness. Give them your living water always. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We give thanks for the lives of all your saints, their hope in you sustained lives of faith and service. Encourage us with the hope they shared in you. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting in your steadfast love and your promise to renew your whole creation. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.
Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. I'm so glad you're here. I'm glad you could tune in on Sunday morning or any time during the week to connect to God, to bring the heavy things that we carry to God and say, take my yoke, trade. Let me take your easy burden, God, and take all that's heavy on my heart. During the season of Lent, we will be doing this and digging a little deeper into ourselves and seeking God to help us. Now, a few things, a few announcements for you this week. Uh, now that we're in March, our ministry of the month is Unbound for March, and it's a great organization and similar to Compassion National. You can sponsor a young person, or you can also sponsor an elderly person. Uh, Unbound allows you to help feed an elderly person and give them medicine and clothing around the world. It's a great thing to do. So this is a wonderful opportunity we have to help and share and bless others. Also, I want you to be aware that this week coming up is our first Wednesday Lenten dinner and worship in person. So if you live across the country or not in the Casey Metro, this obviously probably can't attend. But if anybody who's watching who wants to attend in person, it'll be Wednesday night at 6 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall for the meal. And then we'll have worship at roughly 645. So this is the first time we've done this in almost three years. It's amazing. So I'm excited. I'm looking forward to this. And I hope you could be here with us or even online for holding me prayer. We have you have a great week. Whatever your burden is, whatever regret you may have, turn to God and give it over. Go in peace and share the love of God. Thanks be to God.